Thank you very much. Um, and uh, a very warm welcome to all of you here in the room, to those of you following us uh, on the live stream, whether in English or Chinese, and most definitely a warm welcome to my wonderful panel here this afternoon. You're joining this press conference at the 12th annual meeting of the new champions here in Tianjin, uh, China. And when uh, Professor Schwab decided to do a meeting in China 12 years ago, a lot of people, especially in Europe and, and the US, asked, why are you doing a meeting on technology and science in China? And I think it is fair to say, uh, after today and yesterday and the discussion we've seen here, um, that a lot more people will understand why it's a good place to have a meeting on science, innovation, uh, and uh, technology. Um, we want to take a closer look uh, Yes, on science and technology, but also we want to do a little deep dive into the topic of what's the latest in science and research and the use of technology for food, health and food safety. Um, and I'm particularly happy that we have such a wonderful panel to talk about this subject here today. Let me quickly introduce uh, them uh, to you. Um, we, we simply go by the seating order, so excuse me if I start. Uh, with the gentleman to my immediate left, uh, we're joined here by Carlos Moedas, who is the Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation of the European Commission. And um, uh, while that is a minor aspect, I might add also a co-chair of, uh, of this annual meeting. Um, to his immediate left, uh, we're joined by Katrin de Bock. She's a Professor of Exercise and Health at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, right at the heart uh, and center of our panel here today, we're joined by Laura Nyström, um, who's the professor for food biochemistry, also based in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, that's not a Swiss bias by the forum, uh, it's just that uh, these uh, ladies are excellent and happen to be based in, in Zurich. Um, uh, then we're also joined uh, by Eva Angoen, who is the uh, professor at the University College in Dublin. and. Um, I've never heard this before, but you're a professor for biosystems and food engineering, so very intrigued to, to hear from you here today. <laughs> and last, but uh, definitely not least, we're joined uh, by Jean-Pierre Bourguignon uh, here today, who's the uh, president of the European Research Council, uh, also based in Brussels. Um, I'll stop talking now and hand over to the commissioner. Commissioner Moedas, the floor is yours. What would you say to somebody who's still doubting whether China is a good place to talk? about science and technology? I think China is a great place uh, to talk about technology and science and is a great opportunity for us Europeans to come here and tell you what we are the best and what are the good things that we do. And if there's something that we are really good at is fundamental science. And uh, the European Research Council represents exactly the best of the best of science in Europe. And uh, when I started, uh, and Jean-Pierre Bourguignon is the president of the European Research Council, um, I can tell you that for me it was really one of the amazing parts of my job was to meet people like Catherine Eiffel Laura to discuss science because they are the best of the best. And, and the best of the best have for me two characteristics. One is that they're really good at what they do, of course, but apart from that, they are able to tell their stories in a way that engages people. Uh, and Europe needs that. And so I, I'm very proud to be here with, uh, with the three of you uh, because you represent uh, what we have really in Europe as the best science and the best research and the engagement with the public. Uh, I think that we have taken very seriously uh, betting on fundamental science in Europe. We have a proposal for 100 billion euros uh, for science and innovation for our next cycle of the budget. And that is thanks to people like you, people that have proved to the European taxpayer that investing in science is um, not only uh, something great for society, but it's our duty. Uh, because if you want to create jobs, if you want growth, you need to invest in science and innovation. So um, I'm extremely happy uh, to be here, also because the sector that we're talking, which is health, and in particular food, is important uh, for the future uh, of the earth and the sustainability of us all. I think that um, health is uh, one of these examples that people understand very well, that you can 
can communicate with the people in Europe in a way that they understand what we do. Uh, and I think that you are a little bit the, the ambassadors that we have to talk about this subject matter in a way that people say, look, we're putting, as European taxpayers, we're putting our money in the right place. And the right place is to think, how can we really, in terms of food and nutrition, how can we get to a better place? Uh, you know, we had uh, these, I would call it, the way of looking at health for 100 years was about you diagnose, you treat, you recover, right? And the way they look at it is so different, is about uh, going from the illness to the patient, or the illness to the person, the person at the center, to go from a, a world of closed data to a world of open data, um, and uh, to go from a world that will be um, not just human only, will be human plus technology led uh, in terms of care, in terms of looking at the future. So, uh, look, thank you very much for um, inviting me to be part uh, of this conference, um, but uh, you uh, are really uh, the stars of Europe, and uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to be able to share this moment. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Now, uh, Katrin, every morning I, uh, when I take the bus to this conference center, I see in every park, basically in Tianjin, I see a group of Chinese citizens practicing Tai Chi or doing some, some open air exercise. And, and while I've been studying that, you've been going a little bit deeper on the subject of, of health and exercise. Um, maybe you can share with us uh, what are you working on? What are really the highlights? And, and, and what's, your, what's your passion about this topic? So what my lab actually does, and for which I have received a starting grant for e, uh, from ERC, is we study how blood vessels interact with the muscle. And the reason why I am so interested in muscle is actually the following. Now, at this moment, we see really a massive rise in the, in the number of people with non-communicable diseases, such as obesity, the metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and also cancer. And these diseases have one thing in common, they can be prevented by exercise. That's why we exercise. And even though we all know that exercise makes you healthy or keeps you healthy, how exercise does so and the molecular mechanism behind this are very poorly understood. And obviously the muscle is central in this because the muscle contracts, the muscle induces movement, and this movement then increases health. Now even though we do understand a lot on how muscle increases health, uh, particularly the muscle fibers have been very intensely studied. There are many more other cell types in the muscle. And my lab is particularly interested in the blood vessels. Why? Because those blood vessels bring the food to the muscle, but also deliver waste products out of the muscle, and they deliver all health-promoting factors throughout our body, uh, which then in the end impact on the brain or impact on our heart and make us healthy. Uh, so in, 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 in detail, we study how blood vessels grow in the muscle upon exercise, because we know that whenever you start to exercise, whenever you move, your blood vessels grow in the muscle, and we hypothesize that this growth of blood vessels is really required for the health-promoting effects of exercise. And um, this we study uh, using a combination of several uh, techniques, using uh, mouse models, human samples, and, and we hope to translate these findings uh, to people with disease. So, so we, we actually study health and how exercise promotes health to find novel therapeutic targets to help out people with diseases such as obesity, such as the metabolic syndrome, etc. Thank you very much. And Laura, um, that's, that's a wonderful bridge over to your work um, because you are you're fighting the same good fight than Katri, um, but you are coming from a slightly different angle. So you, if I understand correctly, you're looking at how our, our diet can help promote health. And as I think you're also looking in particular at fiber, the role of fiber. Exactly. Maybe you can, you can add to what Katrin just said and, and share your, your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So I could more or less use in a several cases similar vocabulary and same words as, uh, as Katrin did. Uh, so we're also interested in preventing the occurrence of the non-communicable diseases. So in, in a way, how could we, with our diet and with our food that we eat, influence and prevent the, the um, rising of the cardiovascular diseases and type 2 diabetes, for 
example. And this is, uh, so it's again, instead of going from curing illnesses to rather prevent the illness from arising in the first place. And the compound, as mentioned in, in my lab and what is in the, in the center of our interest are dietary fibers. So fibers that you find in plant-based foods, um, they can be either uh, insoluble, so hard uh, solid fibers, and my group and also my ERC project is mostly focused on soluble fibers, so they're compounds that can be found in water solutions, they can be solubilized in water, and they interact again in, with all the nutrients in our, in our foods. So they can, for example, slow down the absorption of sugars in our gut, they can prevent and inhibit the reabsorption of cholesterol in our gut, so they modulate the, the absorption of different nutrients uh, through interactions. And we, in my lab, we're developing methods how to measure these interactions and how to then reflect this and, uh, to, the, um, to the health benefits of different types of fibers and uh, in a way modifying uh, or being able to measure them and, and optimize the uh, intake or recommendations for dietary fiber intakes. And again, as Katrin similarly, wanting to work, work on a molecular level, understanding really deep down in the, uh, the chemistry of the fibers and the, and the molecules they interact with. Thank you, thank you very much. Eva, um, China had uh, arguably had some issues with food safety in the past. That's, that's no secret. I understand in your work, um, you focus very much on imaging technology. Uh, maybe you can share how that technology can contribute to, to a safer and more healthier diet. Sure. Um, so just like to, to tell you, first of all, that um, the European Research Council has been fundamental in my setting up my research lab. Um, I got a, a ERC starting grant a few years ago, and that allowed me to set up my, my own research lab at University College Dublin, and also to, to get together a team of researchers which has grown from just three researchers to now 10. And we all uh, are specialists in hyperspectral imaging. So that's a sp special type of imaging um, where we look at objects at hundreds of different wavelengths. And this allows us to get information about the composition of these objects and to understand how they change in different biological systems. And we use hyperspectral imaging at a fundamental level and also through to an applied level. So with the ERC project, we're using hyperspectral imaging to try to understand how medical implants interact with the human body. So we're developing methods to measure the interactions between implants, basically polymers, okay, uh, and water and proteins and cells, because we think that these interactions are very important in the, the, the future compatibility of medical implants. Um, but another important factor is how bacteria grow on these implants inside the body. So we are looking at new methods to try to understand this with the ERC project, but on a more applied level, we're also working with clinicians to develop screening tools for cancer using hyperspectral imaging. And also we're, we're looking at bacteria that grow on food surfaces and on foods. So we go from the very microscopic, even down to nanoparticles, where we look at the interactions between nanomaterials and cells, for example, all the way up to the macroscopic level where we look at actual food produce. So we can detect um, bacteria growing on foods, for example, and we're trying to develop this further so we could in the future have new tools to measure food safety in an automated and fast way. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Jean-Pierre, thank you for, first of all, for bringing these fantastic researchers here, here to China. Um, You've been working with a lot of the researchers over the years. Um, and obviously, you brought three individuals here who have been very successful in what they do and, and you know, cutting, breaking new ground. Um, let's say on our live stream, there's a lot of young students, maybe researchers themselves from China, from the world uh, uh, listening. What's your advice to them? Well, I think uh, it's a very good uh, question because actually uh, we need a new generation. And uh, you need the young people to be motivated to, to really do science. And uh, today, one can do science in many different ways. 
uh, of course, get, you need to get the training, so you get, get the um, stimulation to study uh, science in depth. But now it's clear that uh, actually there is not only the academic uh, way, but there could be also some other ways. And uh, it's, it's very important for me in what has been said to, to stress um, really how much uh, the distance in some cases between fundamental research and applied research actually has been shortened. You can even sh speak about short circuits in, in some cases. Some other cases not, but it's still there are fundamental science which takes uh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to really become uh, really a new, new world. And uh, the example I always give is quantum mechanics which of course was a curiosity for physicists in the early 19th century. Now it's uh, the basics of uh, every engineer today and nanotechnology and everything we are using at this level is of this kind. So the European Research Council from that point of view is a, a program of uh, the European Union which really uh, has been putting a lot of emphasis on younger people. So it shows that, uh, and particularly it has been said by some of the people who spoke today, that it really enabled them to develop a group around them. And these are two sides to this. One side, of course, is the resources which are put at disposal, but also the other side is to convince the institution people are working in that really young people should be given confidence and the freedom to develop their activities. This is not uh, so obvious because in some countries or some institutions, actually you still want the elder people like me to really control everything and not give the, the free ride for, for the younger people. So I think for young people today, I think uh, it's very important that they are there to, to dream, to come up with their dreams. And people who apply to ERC, they know that if they want to have a chance of being successful, they have to come up with their craziest idea, if you allow me to formulate it this way, to really be ambitious. If they come with a business as usual, they have no chance. So this is the idea, that we really are looking for the best possible things for the future. And I'm always very pleased, actually uh, pleased because we did it, to, when I hear uh, grantees from the ERC who tell me I submitted a similar project to my national uh, funding agency, they refused it because it was too risky. And I'm glad to hear that we do fund some risky projects. Of course, some will fail, but that's the only way we can really get breakthroughs, by really people being ambitious, looking for, uh, for re great things. Now, my final words have to do also with this international dimension. I think uh, maybe one thing, a comment we could get from uh, the, the researchers who are here who already sh told us about their research, but also they already mentioned that they are not alone to do that. They are really in teams. And I'm sure their themes are very, very international. So this international dimension shows that on the one hand, uh, definitely uh, research is a, is a pub science is a public good, and therefore it has to be open, it has to be accessible everywhere. But also it's so important that we organize and we encourage and we facilitate uh, really the uh, uh, brain circulation. That is, people being exposed to another environment is something which is the best way to grow, actually. And of course, the key point is that there should be a circulation. That is, they are not a place where everybody gets concentrated and stays there. But I think uh, from this point of view, I think ERC is uh, really doing uh, quite an important job. Presently, we have exactly 35 uh, grantees who are Chinese. That is, people who are really based in Europe doing that. Actually, they were already in Europe when they applied to ERC. But we have more than 800 young Chinese who are either doctoral students or postdoc financed by ERC. And we hope that some of them will consider spending enough time to, to, to Europe, maybe coming back to China, maybe developing things. So I think science and ERC is one instrument, which the European Commission has developed for that, is really an instrument which is totally open to the world and definitely for which I think uh, we, we hope to be participate in this uh, circulation, brain circulation, which is absolutely critical for the future of, of science, but also for the future of humanity altogether. Thank you very much. And, and let me ask our, our three uh, professors here, um, on a range from, I feel like I'm talking to a three-year-old, to, oh, the people here at the event actually are understanding the importance of basic research, because let's face it, this is not a science conference. You have political leaders, uh, and you're excluded because you crossed over from the <laughs> academic world into public service. But uh, a lot of the, your, your, your fellow participants here are not, their day-to-day -day business is not science. Do you feel they understand the importance of the work you do? And the question goes to, goes to all of you. So, if I may, I, I think so. I think most of the people, if not all the people here present, show massive interest into basic science. I think we, 
meanwhile realize that there is a bridge between science and technology and that we need each other. I mean, if we want to stay relevant on the, on the long term, then we need to find ways to also connect with people who bring our discoveries to the public, to the patients in my, in, in my case. Mm. So there is a really nice atmosphere from that point of view here in the, in the conference. You see it the same way? Yeah, I would say it's one of the main reasons I came to this conference because I usually go to a very specialized scientific conference so it's amazing to have the opportunity to talk about your science to you know, people from completely different areas. And what I found is people are very open and curious. Even if they don't necessarily understand what you're talking about, they want to learn. So it's a great opportunity for that. That's good. That's good. So, uh do you yeah. want to add to that? I, I mean, I would fully agree with that. And I would also say that people um, are at very different levels of how much they understand of the science that we do. Everybody appreciates and appreciates the importance of that. But on the other hand, it also tells me that for us, it's very important to disseminate our research and, and disseminate the results that we get and, and also be able to tell the stories and the, the findings in, a, in, in different levels that, that uh, everybody can understand also the importance of that. Um. Thank you very much. Selfishly, again, I've asked all the questions so far. Let's open up the, the floor for, for questions and answers. Uh, we have a microphone here. If I could see a show of hands who would like to ask a question. Don't be shy. Well, uh, while, you, while you collect your courage, maybe I can, I can get another question uh, to you, Commissioner. Um, you've been uh, uh, you, you're returning to the MNC. It's not. Uh, it's even your second time as a co-chair. Uh, so, listening to uh, your fellow panelists, it seems like you've been quite successful in putting science, innovation, and tech on the agenda of the meeting. Um, where do you see the, the science and innovation dialogue between China and Europe developing in the in the coming years? So we, um, uh, in since I've started this job. Um, I was very fortunate to um, uh, really have a fantastic dialogue with my counterparts here in China, the Minister of Science, and we created a co-fund, uh, basically a mechanism where uh, we put around 100 million euros from the EU side, and the Chinese side puts around 30 million euros, and we have had more than 300 now participations in more than 100 projects, where you have the Chinese researchers with the European researchers working together, um, and uh, the Chinese part funds their side, we fund our side, but we work together. And I, I think that's very unique because uh, um, I don't have a lot of those mechanisms in other parts of the world. And so um, I've been here also to congratulate the, the Chinese uh, government for their openness in creating in such a short span of time a mechanism that works very well. So that's one of the ways. The second one is with the ERC and all uh, the principal investigators and, and the researchers that work in teams of the ERC grantees, uh, which uh, Jean-Pierre just, uh, just told us about it. And I think that we have a fantastic opportunity, right? I mean, I, I think that if you look at innovation um, in um, basically some dimensions that you could say science and engineering in one side, and the other side, customers and efficiency. I would say that Europeans have a long tradition of science and engineering. And uh, the Chinese today are leaders in terms of innovating towards the customer because you can, with your scale, immediately touch millions of people, and also in terms of efficiency. So if you put these four angles of innovation together, you see that our relationship in between China and the EU is a win-win. Uh, um, it's really a win-win game where we can really make a difference and because we can always all of us win in both of these uh, four dimensions. So I'm very happy uh, to, to be here, and I'm very happy that our collaboration is getting better by the day. Uh, and so um, uh, we're working for the future. And so in the next program, we will renew, I hope, uh, our uh, collaboration with uh, all of your uh, Chinese students, PhDs, researchers, with our uh, European counterparts.
Thank you, Commissioner. I understand we have a question from the lady in the back. If you could identify your organization and uh, tell us your name, please. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, I'm from Caixin Media from China, and uh, I have a, I think it's a simple question. How to motivate our scientists and uh, researchers, especially the young generation, to do such uh, fundamental researches? Because sometimes these kind of projects are hard to uh, use into the clinical or practical field or hard to uh, attract investment. How to motivate them? Thank you very much. I, don't, I mean, I, I, I just, I will just kick it off and think that they can tell on the ground now. That I think that um, people love science. If you explain science to people, uh, if you tell them the story, uh, they get very excited about it. When I go to schools to see young people, very, very young people in a primary school, and you come with a video of science, and it's told in a way that they understand, they just get very excited. But probably don't do enough of that. But uh, so... Uh, I can basically testify on this. I, I am convinced that being a scientist is the best job there is in the world. I mean, I can discover new things every day. Uh, it's, I'm very passionate about it. For me, I, it's, it's also not that difficult to try and... and, and spread my passion about it uh, on a daily basis. I think there is still much to discover. We are at the basis of changes, of, of discovering things that change the world. So I think it's a very nice profession to do. I, I can also completely agree. I think all, all scientists are very passionate about their work and I think with all the ups and downs that we get during our work, it needs a certain passion because otherwise you would just give up. Um, I think what comes to uh, translating the findings of fundamental science to practice, it's, it's, a, it's a big hurdle and I think we scientists are often happy when we just discover something and we're able to find an, an answer to the question whether it's just out of academic interest or not. Um, and of course, that's not sufficient. We also need to bring it to practice. And I think it is increasing the amount, how much we interact with the, let's say, with the industry, how much dialogue there is between uh, companies and universities, but it's still not sufficient. I think there has to be more active um, connections, networking, being able to explore outside your own field and everything. Um, so it's, it's kind of, easy and comfortable just to stay within your enthusiastic researcher zone, but I think we also have to actively push ourselves out and then, in a way, drag along the, the other, others um, to the same direction. Yeah, I, I, I would strongly agree. I mean, we're, we're funded by the public, so we have a, a strong duty to engage with them and try to explain what we're doing mm -hmm. and to inspire the next generation. Um, I could share one um, really interesting engagement activity that um, a postdoctoral researcher in my group is currently working on. Her name is Anna Herrero, and she is also an artist, as well as being a hyperspectral imager. And what we produce, of course, every day are lots of images. So she's uh, put together an initiative where she's going to print out large pictures of our images of research and bring them to a public park and she's going to bring a group of children to do art based on the images that we produce in the lab. And then they can find out more information about the scientists and the science behind the images. So I think the public engagement is really important there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, mindful of the time, if there is no further question at this moment, I will close this press conference, uh, but not without thanking my panel uh, for, for these wonderful insights into uh, both your work but also your thinking around the importance of science in society. Um, thank you very much for being here today with us in the room, and thank you all for watching online. Thank you very much. Thank you.